Hello and welcome to this episode of the Ideas Factory. Pakistan looks incredibly isolated uh, in its own neighborhood. Very interesting to and fro tug of war between Nawaz Sharif and Imran Khan. What's happening really domestically? And he's just been elected on an India Out campaign. Political space is becoming very contested and the balance that many governments and mostly all governments in Maldives have tried to, you know, strike between India and China. He came uh, through the India Out campaign they have to respond otherwise uh, american credibility goes down and, and america comes out as a weaker state iran feels that it is uh, comfortably placed that iran feels that it has put america on a back foot the arab gulf states which are which are clearly worried all around the region there is a real worry what is happening in the red sea and what is what the houthis are doing Hello and welcome to this episode of the Ideas Factory. Uh, on this episode of the Ideas Factory, first let us look at some of the big headlines that we've seen around the world this week. Uh, first of all, the neighborhood Pakistan, where uh, the ex Prime Minister Imran Khan has been sentenced to a further ten years of jail, which completely spoils his political ambitions and also his party's elections are around the corner. Other than that, we've seen the bizarre scenes inside the parliament in Maldives. Uh, the pro and anti-China group fighting there, and the and the spat has given us some very dramatic visuals. So we look at that. Then, of course, the uh, attack on the U.S. troops in Jordan. What does that mean? Will Biden retaliate? And what does it really mean for the U.S. elections and the confrontation between U.S. and uh, U.S. and Iran? So we look at all of that, Harsh, on this episode of the Ideas Factory. Uh, let's begin uh, with Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan, which was already in a lot of flux politically and economically, and we've seen a recent uh, uh, confrontation between Iran and Pakistan on the borders. But the elections are around the corner. Imran Khan was already jailed, has been sentenced to further 10 years. There are questions on the legitimacy of this election too. Uh, there are huge supports for Imran Khan still amongst the people and on the streets. But what do these elections now mean for Pakistan? Will there be any legitimacy of this election and also the regional conflict that we see in that area? How does it impact Pakistan? Uh, thanks, Nagma. Uh, you know, in some ways, uh, Nagma, the, the uh, domestic vulnerabilities of Pakistan, political and economic, uh, are now being reflected in its foreign policy and how the neighbors are looking at Pakistan and its role in the region, uh, which is which has been quite dramatic because now we have a peculiar situation of three of its neighbors um, they're pointing fingers at Pakistan on the issue of terrorism, India, Afghanistan and Iran. So Pakistan looks incredibly isolated uh, in its own neighborhood. Uh, but I think the, the point here is that the vulnerabilities that has been, uh, you know, that, that the, the, the domestic vulnerabilities that are getting exposed with every single day. And as you mentioned, it's it's an extraordinary situation where uh, someone who was, uh, you know, the, uh, you, who was a part of the establishment almost, had the blessings of the establishment, has now been relegated to prison, to the margins of, 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 uh, of Pakistani polity. And someone who was at one point discredited by the same establishment is being brought back uh, uh, it, as, a, as a savior almost. So in some ways, this, this uh, very interesting uh, to and fro tug of war between Nawaz Sharif and Imran Khan, uh, it, it tilts one way or the other, depending on uh, where which side the military establishment uh, wants to go and how, you know, so, so the puppet master seems to be uh, in control all the time. And I think that is what is, in, is, is quite um, I, uh, problematic about Pakistan and, and Pakistani democratic evolution. Because while, you know, some people have looked at it and said, at least they are having elections regularly now. But the, cha but the ch challenge here is that those elections are always under this shroud of who the military is supporting. And therefore, they are never uh, uh, seen as credible by the Pakistani street. And as you point out, again, this time you have a, you have a situation where Nawaz Sharif is being brought back uh, as someone who can guarantee outcomes in, in Pakistan. Uh, but at the same time, on the streets of Pakistan, you see support for Imran Khan. Imran Khan remains incredibly popular. Uh, so how will this pan out in terms of Pakistan's own uh, stability over the over the next few years once you have a government next month uh, and that starts working that remains to be seen at the same time the region and the regional neighbors uh, as we were discussing uh, are all now targeting pakistan uh, and, uh, and are making a case that pakistan 
continues to be uh, a challenge for the for them uh, in in terms of terrorism and broader security issues and this is quite again uh, interesting because at one point when taliban had come back to power uh, it had seemed as if pakistan would be in control and pakistani leaders had assumed that somehow they would be able to manipulate afghanistan that does not seem to be happening and the taliban have taken an, a very independent position uh, and they have they are put, pushing back against pakistani interference and now we have the situation with iran uh, which i think does not bode well uh, for the region and for uh, for pakistan itself so i think some very difficult decisions on political front economic front and foreign policy front uh, which will uh, you know uh, as the, as a new government takes over next month of course which brings us to the question that how credible will this government be but that does really ma- uh, does that matter at all also uh, we cannot really say if the game is over for imran khan probably he is also waiting for another favorable military disposition to come to power just like nawaz sharif waited um, now if we move on and look at what's happening in the middle east we see that there's a confrontation between the regional and the world powers there the three us troops were killed in the drone attack in jordan us forces are still in iraq uh, though there has been pressure from the iraqi government for these forces to leave and now this attack uh, which probably uh, the hezbollah carried out but the hezbollah also is now saying that they will re- refrain from these attacks but they reserve the right for defense for people in gaza and uh, for the liberation or the freedom of iraq that they claim also they are distancing iran from this attack but the american establishment harsh has uh, promised to retaliate and there is pressure on biden to retaliate uh, nikki haley and donald trump have been criticizing him over jordan but there are questions that arise because of this uh, number one is a uh, biden deepening the middle east conflict with pressure to respond how do you see this so i think this is a very delicate moment for president biden uh, no doubt about it because he's uh, he is as you point out under enormous pressure and he will respond i think um, uh, you know uh, any uh, us administration would would respond and uh, especially uh, in in an election year uh, there are enormous pressures to be seen as strong leader um, uh, you know there are enormous uh, incentives to respond uh, and i think militarily also many in the us would say that they have to respond otherwise uh, american credibility goes down and and america comes out as a weaker state the question i think is and and that you see in the statements of american policy makers is that there has to be a response which ensures that there is enough deterrence but at the same time that does not es- escalate the conflict to a level where uh, it becomes a direct confrontation between um, us and iran in particular because i think and and we saw that in the statement of, of president biden as well where he said that look i have decided to respond and, and the way that, that we will respond depends on uh, you know a time and place of our choosing but at the same time uh, you know he said i don't want an escalation with visa iran i don't and i think there are there, there is a good argument to be made um uh, about um, america not involving itself in another war in the region which i think has been the premise of the last few administrations uh, from obama to to biden all of them have tried including trump uh, to get out of of these never ending wars uh, especially in the middle east so i think there is a, there, there are uh, contradictory pressures on Uh, on president biden and that is I- encapsulated in some ways by uh, donald trump who is now the front runner in the republican uh, on the republican side um, and who is saying at the same time that uh, biden has uh, made uh, america look weak uh, he he complains that biden has uh, is putting uh, america into a crisis in the middle east uh, putting uh, uh, america once again into this trap of a, of a war in the middle east so i think that reflects the constraints under which uh, a, a biden administration will have to work out but there is no doubt that a response will come and everything depends now on that response and how escalatory that would be um, because if uh, the other side in this case uh, uh, you know the target uh, um, are iranian assets somewhere or uh, or iranian proxies then how do they respond because escalation ladder can be climbed very very rapidly and i think that is the pressure that you see building in the region from the very beginning the aim of all parties was to uh, not let this crisis escalate 
But as we have seen in the last few weeks, it is gradually escalating on its own accord without the leadership on any side having the ability to manage that escalation. And I think that's the most dangerous part. And that's that's what you see uh, in, in, you know, in, when, when the policymakers around the world seem very worried. That is where the, the, actually the, the real worry comes from, that, that there's going to be one spark and then things might just blow out of control. So it has escalated. It is spilling over. Of course, uh, America and Iran are dangerously close to confrontation. Till now, we've seen that they have they have not really engaged directly. There have been, of course, attacks on their allies and proxies. But what happens now? Just to add to this. Uh, what, what do you see as Iran's strategy here? Some also feel that Iran has opened many small fronts for America to engage them in wars on various fronts. Uh, and uh, Iran doesn't have much to lose. And if we see Iran's presence in the area or the influence, it's Syria, it's Iraq, it's Lebanon, Yemen, all these, Gaza, of course. So uh, what, what do you see Iran's strategy here? I think Iran feels um, uh, that it is uh, comfortably placed. That Iran feels that it has put America on a back foot, uh, and that uh, perhaps uh, there is a the, you know, the, the, the constraints that we were discussing on on, on American policy making today. Uh, but, uh, for for many in Iran, this would be very comforting that this is something that Americans are not going to uh, tread uh, e easily on, and and therefore they they seem to have an upper hand. But again, the the question is. Um, you know, the, the escalation that can happen once that escalation happens, then all bets would be off. And I think that's where uh, the Iranians would be particularly worried that while a lot of the proxies might be working under their guidance, but what if the you know the proxies do things which the Iranian regime may, might may not approve? And in this also in this particular case as well, when the attacks have happened on the on the uh, American troops, uh, Iranians actually were very swift to come out and say that look, we don't have any hand in it because I think they are also uh, at at one level worried that if it escalates, it will impose enormous costs on Iran. Of course, it it allows the Iranian regime. Uh, to to have that rally around the flag effect if they are targeted directly. But I think it also imposes enormous costs on the regime itself uh, because they will then have to justify all the economic pains that they will have to bear, uh, on, uh, that, that their people will have to bear. So I think they are also trading very, very cautiously as to how this pans out. But clearly, uh, um, you know, they have a number of assets, they have a number of proxies uh, and, and the region, uh, they seem to be on an ascendant. They seem to be a, a power that, that has a lot of levers they can play with. And you also see uh, the the disquiet on uh, on the other side, which is the um, you know um, Gulf states, uh, uh, the Arab Gulf states, which are which are clearly worried uh, because their priorities, which uh, Saudi priority or, or Emirati priority, which till a few months back was on economic development, suddenly now security is back in the bank uh, and and back at the middle of this conversation, and they are having to once again navigate very difficult ties uh, with the West. Uh, and with Israel uh, at the same time managing Iran that seems to be, uh, you know, um, uh, in some ways more uh, attuned to the sentiment on the street. So I think uh, different regimes in the region are also worried that if it escalates, then not only do their priorities get sidelined, but also their larger strategic relationships come under, under significant strain. So I think all around the region, there is a real worry. And as we have seen, the impact on global trade is already very, very visible. We are already seeing costs rising. We are already seeing inflationary pressures being put in uh, in, in a number of countries, uh, it, you know, what is happening in the Red Sea and what is what the Houthis are doing. So I think all in all, uh, as the world was expecting a revival of economic growth, uh, this crisis has come at a very, very delicate time for the world, for the global economy. And I think for America in particular, which is moving into a, an election year, the choices are hard. But I yeah. think the cho choices are equally hard for the uh, for, for, for Iran as well. Of course. And now that America is moving into the election year, all this that's happening in the Red Sea area, all that's happening in Gaza, in the Gaza and Israel war, is going to impact the American elections because uh, Biden ha is being slammed by his uh, rivals over his policies there. Uh, also, we've seen uh, how Trump has been surging ahead in these U.S. elections and have been already, already talks of his coming back to the White House, of his prospects. But, you know, that also leads us to the question that uh, eventually, lots of people say he's going to lose out in the 2024 elections and what would stop him and how big is the immigrant problem there, which has, is it emerging as a key election, uh, you know, wedge issue for Trump and uh, vulnerability for Biden? How huge will that be? And uh, 
uh, do you think Nikki Haley would have been a better prospect against the Democrats as compared to Donald Trump? See, I think um, on a on a um, uh, on a national level, certainly you can you can make an argument that Nikki Haley um, uh, would have won a lot more independence uh, than than Trump would. But I think these, you know these are incredible times, and and who would have expected that uh, that you will have a candidate uh, who has been once defeated now coming back from again um, uh, from oblivion from so many cases uh, he's being you know uh, asked to pay damages uh, almost every other day he's in court and yet he continues to have this hold on the base of the Republican Party that no other candidate has been able to demolish. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's extraordinary uh, to see American democracy uh, where you have two white old men uh, competing against each other. And, uh, you know, here is a country that used to lecture other countries on what's the good way to, to be a democracy. I think suddenly, uh, I think it raises a number of questions about, uh, you know, where American democracy is headed. But that's for, um, you know, uh, that's for Americans to decide. And at the end of the day, uh, if the base of the Republican Party, which clearly it seems to be, wants Mr. Trump, then he's going to be the nominee. And and, and Nikki Haley may have a better hold on. Uh, on uh, we may we may think that uh, that she would get a, 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 some part of the independence, which Trump may not. But I think you know, uh, one should never. Um, discount Mr. Trump given given the past. We have seen how he has this ability um, to come back um, from oblivion. Uh, and he almost, just even last time when Hillary Clinton took him lightly and the results, uh, you know, everyone saw. Uh, I think uh, uh, Biden, uh, Biden administration at the moment seemingly relying on um, um, uh, Perhaps the good economic news that is coming out of America. The, I think the expectation is that the uh, that if the economy is doing well, then it usually pays the incumbent uh, in in the electoral map. Uh, but I think these are very very uh, testy times for the U.S. And given how we what we are discussing uh, wars and conflicts and and uh, and other pressures. Uh, it's very difficult to to make any kind of an assessment uh, other than the fact that it's very likely to be uh, a Biden versus Trump um, uh, contest once again. At this mm -hmm. point, I think Nikki Haley's uh, days are numbered as, as, as a candidate. Of course, like she says, uh, she's not going to give up, but it looks like, like you said, the Biden versus Trump. Um, now, I know we don't have much time, but, uh, you know, before I wrap up, uh, the way we've seen very bizarre scenes from the Maldivian Parliament, the Majlis, uh, the fights, it almost looked like, um, you, you know, fists and fist fights happening there. But what is happening there? What's the story behind this? We, we, India has always wished well for Maldives and has been a very, very faithful uh, neighbor, uh, always uh, helping in times of need, all of that. But this new president, uh, you know, who's tilted towards China, is pro-China. But what's happening really domestically? And he's just been elected on an India Out campaign, but right now we see so much opposition for his pro-China policies. Uh, so what's the reason behind these scenes that we've seen in the parliament? I think uh, the, the political space is becoming very contested and the balance that many governments and mostly all governments in Maldives have tried to you know, strike between um, India and China, that balance have, uh, somehow seems to have gone awry under, under Muizu. And that is what is being reflected in, uh, in the opposition versus the government clash that, you know, it, if you are not able to balance two of your important partners carefully, then I think the this, the likelihood of uh, domestic politics also getting polarized uh, in, in a in, in a country like Maldives become high. And I think the way Mr. Moizu has uh, has played his cards, they have been quite uh, disastrous uh, to, to be to be to be you know honest. Because uh, when you know that you have two important partners, and this is this is a geographical reality that. Most states in the in the in 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 the Indian Ocean region in South Asia face uh, when you know that you have to balance both of them carefully, then there is no need to go all out uh, or out of your way, um, you know, to um, uh, to to downplay one side. And I He's think made a mistake there. Mm -hmm. he seems to have overplayed that 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 hand, uh, and and in the process, he has also alienated a large part of domestic constituencies which which want uh, a balanced foreign policy and i think that is what is getting reflected in the parliament that is also getting reflected in the kind of statements that are coming out and i think uh, given that he 
I mean, in some ways, it was expected that he came uh, through the India Out campaign uh, in, into into limelight, and he has driven the India Out campaign. But you always expected that once in government, uh, you would be governing with a sense of uh, propriety and with a sense of semblance of normalcy. I think that has not happened, and that divisions are getting reflected in in Maldives. And I'm afraid this political turbulence, if the present trends continue, is only going to uh, be a continuing factor. Because uh, Mitsu Moizu has not even uh, made an outreach to the other side in, in a significant way, or has mm -hmm. tried to allay their apprehensions that he's going to be uh, just beholden to China. So I think some of the turbulences can can be expected to continue. Uh, I mean, and does he look like on his way out, or is it too soon to say? I mean, with impeachment and all that uh, proposed. I think it's too too soon to say because the numbers are uh, are uh, not as uh, as much stacked against him as they uh, you know as 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 is being made out. He can still wriggle out of this, and he has uh, you know support from some significant quarters. Uh, but I think uh, governance would be a difficult issue. Uh, you can survive in you know as as a leader, but then would you be able to govern such a polarized and fractious country? That I think will continue to hamper his ability to deliver on a number of fronts that he he wanted That's to have important. as a leader. That's a very important question he may he may survive but will he be able to govern such a divided society thank you so much harsh we have time for just this much on this episode but very interesting times and developments uh, all around the world so we'll bring you the latest very soon thank you so much for watching